Hi, and welcome to What's New in Aerospace. I'm Marty Kelsey. I host a show here at the National Air and Space Museum called STEM in 30 for middle school science students. And I cannot tell you guys how excited I am to introduce our guests today. They were crewmates on Expedition 42 and 43. Today we have Samantha Cristoforetti, who spent 200 days in space, becoming the longest single space flight by a female, correct? Yes. And we have Terry Vertz, who is the pilot of STS-130 and the commander of Expedition 43 on the International Space Station. Let's give them a round of applause to welcome them. <laughs> so I want to start off with, with one of the big, important questions, and that is, Samantha, how is the espresso on the International Space Station? <laughs> wasn't bad. It wasn't bad at all. Um, it was a great improvement over the instant coffee I had been drinking for, for almost six months. Um, and, and it was uh, a delivery from home, so it was uh, uh, very nice and very appreciated. I do have to say that Terry was with me as well for 200 days on the space station. <laughs> well, and, and Terry, you spent 212 days in space with the shuttle and the station, <laughs> correct? Um, now, you're a big baseball fan. And I, I loved the pictures you put on Twitter of all the stadiums on opening day. Were you able to catch any of the games while you were in space? We did. Uh, that was actually a lot of fun to try and get all the baseball stadiums around the country. The ones on the coast were easy to find, but the ones in the middle of the country were a little bit tougher. Uh, they don't stand out quite as well. But uh, the ground was a little link up spring training games and once the season started baseball games. And that was fun to stay connected with Earth and, the, and my favorite sport. Awesome. Now, you guys were both very active on social media while you were in space. It, how important is it to connect with people on, on Earth when you're up in space? It's super important. We can do events like this, which are great to be live in person talking to folks, but obviously that's limited, and social media goes around the globe. And uh, I had lots of followers in India and the Philippines, and Turkey was one of the most popular countries following us. Samantha I had many more. And so we were, were able to reach literally the whole Earth through that, and, and that was a lot of fun to do that. Okay. And so how about you? you? You enjoy that conversation back to Earth when you're in space? Yeah, it, it, it wasn't, unfortunately, as much as I would have liked a conversation, because uh, we do have access to the Internet from space, but it's not so um, easy to use it, and it's not so fast as it is from, from the ground. Um, and so in the end, I shared a lot. I, I didn't really have the chance to maybe answer as many questions as I would have liked and, and stuff like that. But yes, I, I went into the space flight with a commitment to share as much as possible. In fact, I had started a lot earlier. I started writing a logbook um, about 500 days before launch, so a year and a half almost before we launched, in which I detailed all the aspects of, uh, of training. And, so, um, and then when I went to space, I continued to do that. So it's not only the pictures out there, but I actually try to, to tell the story, and, it, and it's all archived, it's all on the internet. So if you're ever curious what it is to train for the International Space Station or what daily activities people do up there, um, it's, it's on the internet, you can find it. Now, the International Space Station is a huge cooperation from many, many countries. Why should the average person on the street care about what's going on up, up in the in, on the space station? Uh, one of the things we say is that we're uh, off the planet for the planet. And the mission of the space station is multifaceted, but the most important uh, aspect of what we do is science. And there's a lot of science experiments. Uh, one of the most important and fun ones that we did was uh, working on new medicines with some drug companies that launched experiments. There's also uh, biology, physics, material science, astronomy, and cosmology. So basically any discipline of science, they have an experiment on board the space station. So a lot of what we do uh, is applied science that can be applied to uh, problems that we have, have here on Earth. Okay. Now I've always wanted to know this. Is there a unique smell <coughs> when you go onto the space station for the first time? Actually, the space station has a very neutral smell. Um, the filters work very well, so um, I expected a little bit of a bad smell. You know, a lot of people living in cramped quarters for a long time, but uh, the, the ventilation system and the filtering systems are, uh, are great. Um, what what uh, we tend to call the space smell, which is not really the smell of space, but when a, when a new vehicle comes up and docks, when you open the hatch, mm -hmm. um, I remember Terry <coughs> calling me over and saying, hey, go and, and smell, you know, feel the smell of space, and it's really, 
I guess it's the metal that's been exposed to, you know, the, ma the external material of that vehicle that's been exposed to outer space. So it's kind of it's kind of cool because when a vehicle comes and there's this this part of it where the hatch is, which is in outer space in vacuum for a long time, and then it's docked or berthed to the space station, and it makes a solid connection, and then you open both hatches, but you you have this part which now it's inside, it's part of your home, but uh, you know a few hours earlier was in space, and so it it's uh, you know it, it it's probably some kind of uh, chemical reaction that goes on and uh, um, off-gassing. I'm not exactly sure, but it smells, it's bad. I mean, it's a mix of burnt and foul and, and food gone bad and <laughs> it's terrible. Uh, but anyway, it, go, it goes away very quickly. <coughs> so when those resupplies came up, what was the best thing that they sent? <laughs> I think fresh fruit. I, that's something that, the food there is actually pretty good, but it's all packaged and freeze-dried and dehi dehydrated. So. The uh, fresh fruit, we got some apples and carrots and oranges, and, and that's always everybody's favorite because we hadn't had that smell in a long time, and it just tastes good, so that was, that was fun. Was fruit one of the things that you missed most from <coughs> Earth, or was there something else? Shower. Shower, yeah. <laughs> it was weird taking a shower for the first time. Uh, it was kind of painful. It felt like someone was jabbing you with a lot of little needles to feel the water. Uh, but yeah, the fruit, and fr not only fruit, but just any kind of fresh fruit, food or bread. Also, there's not bread in Spain. We don't have bread there. We have tortillas, but that's not bread. So that was another thing I missed. Okay. Um, so is there anything from the space station that you miss having here on Earth? The view <laughs> um, and weightlessness. There's all this gravity down here on Earth, and it was, it was a lot of fun to float. Um, it's, there's nothing like it on Earth, and so that's just a really unique, almost alien thing that we do in space, and you have to learn how to do it. It takes a few weeks before you get really good at it, and, uh, and that's a lot of fun. Did you crash into anything the first couple days? We didn't have any big bruises or yeah. scrapes, I don't think. So, sometimes that happens. Um, we were actually pretty, pretty safe. Sort of. Sort of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was your favorite thing on Earth to look at as you were flying over? I don't think there's one favorite thing. There's too many. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, Earth is amazing, and there's no way that you can pick like one place. It, it's like, um, you know, I guess it depends how you feel that day. But you know, that there's there's a lot of amazing places. You know, the, the Caribbean and uh, Patagonia was one uh, place I like to fly over. Um, Northern Africa with this amazing red and um, mm -hmm. Australia. Uh, the Himalayas, and then of course uh, I'm Italian, so I love flying over Italy and, and over Europe as a whole. I mean, Europe is so tiny. <laughs> I mean, you know, we, um, you know, you, you really realize uh, up there how smaller countries are over in Europe, and so you, you actually breeze over Europe in like 10 minutes, and you, it's like, oh, that's, that was it. <laughs> Were you able to see your hometowns? Yes. Mm -hmm. You're from Baltimore, correct? Born in Baltimore and raised in PG and Howard County. Okay. Okay, awesome. Well, here in a few minutes, we're going to take a few questions before they get into their full-on presentation. So if you've got a question, you can come on over here to the microphone, and we'll be ready for those here in just a minute. Um, you can see Myra in the back, and she has some uh, forms for you to fill out if you want to ask a question. Um, what was the most surprising thing about being on the space station? That's a great question. There's a lot of surprising things. Of course, like I talked about, the view of the Earth but I think the, uh, the learning process of how to live in space, because it's not Earth, there's no gravity, you're floating. Not only are you floating, but everything, like this would be floating around. And, and so just the ability to um, do basic things, like get dressed in the morning. You have to organize your clothes in a certain way. Everything has to have Velcro stuck to a wall or it's gonna float away. And so the process of learning how to live in space and not be an Earthling anymore, you know, be a spaceman, or, it was, that was really interesting for me. How about you? Yeah, very much that, I have to say. Um, and also, I guess how much I enjoyed little things that I knew would be fun, but um, like, you know, flying. Not, not, it's not so much floating, but it's really flying. I mean, you, you're, uh, uh, um, you're flying for 200 days all day. And uh, I don't know, I, I used to dream a lot about flying when I was, especially growing up, but I, I had those dreams when I was actually flying. Not flying on an airplane, but really flying, like in space. and. And all of a sudden, I could do this for real. And uh, how much I enjoyed that uh, kind of surprised me. I mean, it's, it's such you, an enjoyable feeling. Do you dream in weightlessness when you're in space? 
I think I dreamt less in space than I do now. Yeah, it was interesting. People ask that all the time, and I think we were so tired to work. There was a pretty busy place. Um, I had some, but not that many. And it was usually of Earth and like weather, rain or wind, things like that you don't have in space. And so just re trying to remember Earth. I got to a point where I couldn't remember what it was like to be in gravity. Like I was trying to think, what is it like to stand or to sit or, you know, I, I had forgotten what that felt like. Wow. Yeah. All right, we've got a question. You know, I, I don't think we did. I, I didn't feel that. The place to be claustrophobic would have been in the Soyuz capsule. The launch and landing, that, that is really small. You can, there's a seat over here. You can kind of see how cramped that is. And um, so the, the claustrophobic, that would be the time that you would feel that would be um, when you're in the spacesuit for launch and landing. Uh, thankfully, we're only there for a few hours, but you kind of do need to use your mind over matter and go, all right, I'm going to sit here. Everything's fine, and I'll be out of this in, in not too long. But it's more cabin fever, I think, that some astronauts have talked about, because the station is big. You're not cramped at all, but it's a, like a 747. So it's a big area, but you can never leave. You know? And even if you do a spacewalk, you're still holding on to the station. And that's only a few hours out of the six months. So um, I think the cabin fever is a bigger issue than, than claustrophobia. Thankfully, I never really felt that way. I was, I was always happy. But I could see that how that could happen, though. As a student, I have lived in a lot more cramped quarters than the space station. <laughs> <laughs> but they let you out before 200 days elapsed, though. That was the difference. Yeah. That's right. true. My second question is, going up in space is kind of like a lifetime achievement pinnacle. Did you feel a letdown when you come back down? I mean, you go, you're both pretty young. Do you feel like, oh, I achieved this big thing? Like, what do you do now? I, every astronaut's favorite mission is their next one. So, um, and you know, the old veterans that have five space flights, they would rather have, be a rookie with one in front of them than with five behind them. So I think Samantha and I would both like to fly again and, and uh, we're gonna enjoy Earth. I haven't really had time to be let down yet. We've had a pretty busy few months, um, but there's nothing like flying in space. And so you kind of have to mentally prepare yourself that there's lots of wonderful things on Earth and that your people and family and friends are here. Um, but the, you know, space is just unique. It's like winning the World Series. You know, Cal Ripken, I'm a baseball fan from the Orioles, won the World Series when, when he was a rookie and played baseball for another 20 years and, and never went back again. So there's just some things in life that are awesome and when they happen you need to enjoy them and realize you may never have a chance to do it again. Hopefully we will, but um, we, we had a great experience. And I mean, being uh, on the space station for 200 days is a, is a good teacher, I think, for, for the times to come when you come back. Because you start out with an incredible peak experience, which is the launch and arriving to the space station. And the first few days where it's a, an amazing experience, everything is exhilarating. Um, but then you are up there for 200 days. So there are some things that become routine. I mean, we're human beings. Everything becomes routine after a while. But you still enjoy it. So it's not about the peak experience anymore. It's just about uh, being happy every day and, and, and like what you do every day. You know, not as a peak, but just as a, as a baseline of, of, of being content with, with what you do. And I think we tend nowadays to select astronauts that have a personality that can live with that. You know, we're not necessarily people who want to um, race to the top of a mountain every single day. You know, it, it's really about um, enjoying what comes every day, whether it's a peak experience or, or whether it's routine. <clears throat> Thank you. Right. We have another question. Go um, well, uh, sorry. Uh, so going up into space and leaving an environment in gravity, I know there are lots of concerns with like bone density, muscle strength, all of that stuff. Um, what types of things do you guys do up there? Like, is there a certain exercise regimen you follow? What type, um, is there certain things that you eat to keep up bone density sure. or anything like that? And then, um, sorry, asking a lot of things, but uh, also, is there some kind of gravity compensation, like inertial with spinning or something like that uh, on the space station? And then, uh, yeah. Well, that's a good question. A, a big effect of weightlessness is that you don't use your bones and your muscles. Like right now, everybody in here is using muscles and their bones are getting exercised just by fighting against gravity and you don't get that when you're in space. And that's a big concern of ours and so they've developed a very good protocol of exercise 
We have basically a weightlifting machine that allows you to do bench press and squats and deadlifts and a treadmill and a, and a, a bicycle. And in combination, um, we come back in pretty good shape. Our, there is a little bit of bone loss here and there, but overall, I didn't lose any bone density as an entire body um, uh, goes. And so the space station, I think one of the biggest success stories that it's had is that we've proven and shown that people can go into space for a long period of time and thrive and work and then come back to Earth in pretty good shape. It's not perfect, there's, other, there's ways we can improve that, but that's a big um, question that's been answered, I think, for, to go further in places like Mars and beyond in the solar system. The station has shown that that's possible. And there is no centrifuge, the second part of your question. Like in the movie 2001, so many parts of that movie have come true and it's amazing how visionary Arthur Clarke was. But the one thing, the space station was rotating and so there was gravity. And in a lot of Hollywood movies, it's expensive to film a movie where they have to float all the time. So yeah. there's always gravity. They just make gravity happen. It saves on the production costs. And um, the, uh, so we don't have an anti-gravity machine. And there, there's no real centrifuge for people. We have small centrifuges for science experiments, but not for us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We've got another question. Uh, no. Hello. Uh, so what was like the hardest part in training to uh, how to space? The hardest part of training? Mm -hmm. So that's a great question because there's lots of different things you need to do. And I'll let Samantha ask this. I'll say for me, it was learning Russian. Russian language is tough. I love languages. I've learned French and German <coughs> and other languages, but Russian was tough. <laughs> uh, for me, I'd say it was spacewalking training. We do that underwater and we prepare to go outside by simulating that we can work weightlessly in the three dimensions by being underwater. And um, we have a wonderful suit that allows us to do that, but it doesn't come my size. And <laughs> not in yours too quite yet. <laughs> not in yours either. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, when you're a small person like me, it's, uh, it's a little bit more challenging because you have to deal with a suit that's a little bit bigger than it should be. Um, and so that, that was definitely challenging, but it was also a lot of fun and uh, I enjoyed it. Good question. All That's right, a good now, question. we've got a video now mm -hmm. of you guys actually up in space. Should we check that out? Yes. Yeah, let's, let's do it. And then we'll do more questions after that. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, I think we're on right now. Real quick, uh, Samantha and I started out as Expedition 42. We launched as a three-person crew along with our Russian cosmonaut, uh, Anton Shkaplerov. We met Butch Wilmore, Sasha Samokutyaev, and Yelena Sarova in space. And uh, halfway through the mission, those three came back to Earth, and Scott Kelly, Misha Kornienko, and Gennady Padalka met us in space um, during Expedition 43. And this is how space station missions go. About a little bit. Yeah, this was our launch on the Soyuz spacecraft from uh, from Kazakhstan. A wonderful, wonderful night launch, as you as you can see. And it was the the three of us in this little cramped uh, little spaceship, which is a tiny little piece on top of the rocket. The rest of the rocket is just fuel. It's basically the the, the different stages, the different engine stages, and a lot of fuel. And once we've used it, they're just detached from the rest, and we keep on going until after eight minutes. We finally get to space, and it's only us in our tiny little little capsule. Um, and as I said, it takes only eight minutes to actually get to orbit. Um, eight minutes in which uh, you are subjected to some uh, acceleration. So basically, you you feel a lot of weight on your chest. It's like you all of a sudden you weigh up to like four, four and a half times your normal weight, and it's all kind of pressing on your on your chest. 
and then after eight minutes you get into in weightlessness so you you move from that feeling of pressure on your chest to being floating and light and um, after six hours four times around the earth we went and then finally we got to our destination which is the international space station which you just saw and um, this is just after the hatch opening and it's our uh, you can see me coming through and this is my probably the happiest moment of my life when I got into the space station and I got to hug our colleagues who were already up there, Sasha, Yelena, and, uh, and Butch. And here you can see Terry coming in. There we go. <laughs> the Soyuz vehicle that we launched in, there's a Soyuz right here in the Air and Space Museum in the next room over. It's uh, docked with Apollo and we just had the 40th anniversary of Apollo Soyuz. So you can see the, the size of the capsule and the part that we live in is just the middle part. So when you look at that it's not quite that big, we're just in the very small middle part. Science, as I mentioned, is a big part of what we do on the station. There's lots of different types of science that we do. Um, like I talked about, material science, combustion science, biology. Uh, we, we worked with some pharmaceutical companies on medicines. And uh, this is very interesting. This is a minus 95 degree Celsius freezer that we put a lot of our biology samples in. And uh, you can see all the smoke coming out because it's so cold. We, work, we work really is, fast, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're very busy, we have to work fast in space. <clears throat> yeah, this is the um, microgravity science love box. So we do all kinds of things in there. Terry was actually a resident expert for this facility, but I did get a chance to work in it a little bit for the 3D printer. This was the first time we uh, tested the 3D printing, so addictive manufacturing in space. And it's very exciting because uh, it seems like it worked very well. We, we printed um, things that were printed uh, identically on the ground and then they compare them and, uh, and we even got a, a little wrench. It was the most complex object that, that we printed. Um, and this is a little Italian facility called Cubic. It's a um, centrifuge and incubator and it's uh, used to, to do life science, so cell cultures and tissue cultures and stuff like that. We talked about centrifuges before. This is a small centrifuge in the Japanese library where we were growing plants in weightlessness. And then uh, for science, sometimes you need control groups. So they would compare what the plant was doing in 1G in the centrifuge with, with what it was doing in weightlessness. One of the most fun things that we did was deploy satellites. And there's an airlock, a small airlock in the Japanese module that you can put things in the airlock. The robotic arm comes in and takes it out. So you can go right from inside the space station to outside the space station. And this is a satellite that we deployed back in December um, uh, called SpinSat. And there are several different types of satellites that we deployed. Um, Nanorax CubeSats is another one. Uh, this is a mission that Samantha did a lot of work on that was running right out of Goddard here, if any of you guys are familiar with Goddard yeah, Space. It's a robotic refueling mission. So they were testing different technology for potentially one day refuel satellites robotically. So the, the, you can see this is the slide table that, you know, this, this little airlock, we make a vacuum, we take away all the air, and then the slide table goes out, and then the robotic arm comes and grabs it. And this is the deployment, actually, of CubeSats. Those are really exciting. These are tiny little satellites. Um, they're typically developed by universities, sometimes even high schools. So it's something that maybe you guys uh, will be involved with uh, one day. You know, they're cheap, but they still have significant capabilities, and we launch them among other things and on the space station. So. This is, uh, I'm doing some maintenance work on our bone densitometer. One of the research types we do up there is rodent research. And uh, we actually get to do densitometry to, to check the bone density of rodents directly up there on the space station. Spacewalking uh, is, was a pretty important part of this mission. The space station was assembled over a period of almost a decade, but we're do going through a period of reconfiguration, I call it right now, where we're getting it ready for future American capsules to show up and also for more cargo vehicles to show up. So uh, we did three spacewalks. These are some of the tethers that we use to keep equipment from floating away. And uh, Butch Wilmore and I went outside after Samantha was our uh, inside person getting us suited up in the suits. And uh, this is our first spacewalk going out the hatch for the first time. And that was quite an experience to get outside and, and see the Earth uh, while you're just hanging on with your hands there out in space. Um, it was pretty amazing. The, uh, the spacewalks that we did were, was mostly laying cable. There's a lot of wiring and so on that had to go on in order to prepare um, the capsules to be able to dock. And so uh, Butch and I put down about 400 feet of cable on um, the first two spacewalks. 
And you can see how big the space station is and how small we are out there. That gives you an idea of the size and scope of the space station. But we were running cables down that area to the front where the capsule will dock. And then on the third spacewalk, we laid a different set of about 400 feet of cables um, to some antennas and mirrors that the capsules can use as they um, come up and dock. This is a space selfie, uh, except for it's not really a selfie. It was me upside down and Butch's visor taking a picture of him, but it looks like a selfie. It was one of our favorite pictures. You can see there's lots of equipment tethered to you. And as Samantha was talking about, um, it's just hard to do a spacewalk. It doesn't matter how big you are. Even for big guys, it's, um, it's a lot of work. The suit weighs about 400 pounds and it's pressurized and you are really worn out after a training run in the pool or in space. And we had the opportunity to take out, actually it was a Russian GoPro camera, and this is some of the footage. Um, this is a GoPro selfie, and uh, it, it captures a little bit. And you can hear the sound, if you watch the video on YouTube, you can hear the sound of space, which is, uh, but here's Butch and I th showing off our Air Force and Navy colors there. We put it on our checklist. Yeah, and the other thing about the space station, of course, is, uh, is that it's this, uh, the outpost, this outpost out there and we can't like, go to the supermarket and, and, and shop for food when we need it or you know, go to the shop and buy repair parts. So we have to rely on, uh, on home delivery from, from planet Earth. And uh, these home deliveries come up with uh, vehicles that are different ones. We have a Russian vehicle called Progress. And uh, during our stay twice, we received a um, US Dragon vehicle. That is the one that you saw in the pictures. And uh, what we do, we, um, you know, it comes up and it starts to fly formation with the space station and then we go and grab it with a robotic arm and we attach it to the space station. And then we have five to six crazy weeks of uh, science and cargo ups until we are ready to, um, you know, at the end of this period, send it, send it on its way like you, you can see here. This was uh, one of our dragons departing and going home. And uh, this is a, um, the Russian cargo vehicle that I mentioned, the Progress. We received, we successfully had one dock during our, our mission. See, th th that's real time, it comes in uh, hard. <laughs> um, and, uh, and one unfortunately didn't make it, so we, uh, that was lost. That was towards the end of our mission. And this is the European vehicle, that's the ATV. And uh, it's the very last ATV, ATV-5 departing, and it's a really cool shot. You, you can see it like spitting fire, and that's how it holds attitude as it goes away. And this is another really cool shot. The little plume you see up there is uh, the ATV-5 burning up in, in the atmosphere. A big part of what we do in space is not only science, but it's a million pound vehicle and it needs to be maintained. And so we spent quite a bit of effort uh, repairing equipment and keeping things running. This is the bathroom right here. Uh, this is the American technique of how to saw off a uh, a uh, piece of metal that we had to do. Our Russian colleague saw Samantha and I struggling with this thing and he ran down and got a power saw and came back and after he came back it took about 20 seconds and the, and the piece was sawed off. Um, a fun thing about working in space, if you ever do work on your car, you can just get on the wall and put yourself in the right attitude or put yourself upside down um, and it's not a problem at all to get into the hard to reach places. Um, uh, here Scott, Kelly and I are, are working on some more of the life support equipment. Uh, one of the most fun things that we did was film an IMAX movie that's coming out in the spring. Um, but there's the IMAX camera. Much easier to handle in space than it is on Earth. Um, that thing probably weighs 20 or 30 pounds on the ground. And we were up there for so long we celebrated a lot of holidays. Uh, this is Christmas. We had Christmas morning in space and presents and stockings. And uh, we had Thanksgiving. This is Samantha's birthday. We had some little candle candles and a lemon curd cake and a green pouch there for her. Yeah, that was my 16th birthday. Yeah, 16th birthday. about water balls. Water ball. Water is pretty amazing in space to see how it behaves. And this is the world famous espresso machine. <laughs> and uh, you can see it basically works with pouches. Uh, you know, you have to attach a water pouch and then the, the coffee comes out on the other side. And as I say, it wasn't bad at all. I, I mentioned before we don't have bread in space, but we do have tortillas. And so uh, a lot of astronauts like to put whatever they have. This is Scott have, showing some fish on a tortilla. Um, but uh, it's a way to spice up the food. And spice is very important to our crewmate Butch. He used mustard on, I think, everything, and he, he really enjoyed that. This is me making a hamburger here. Um, ketchup, mustard, mayonnaise, 
a bag of cheese, and a rehydrated beef patty, and uh, it was pretty good. Not, not, not quite Earth hamburger, but it was pretty good. And uh, it was fun to do that every once in a while. I didn't eat this every meal, but occasionally it was okay. And this is an example of the challenges you face in zero G, right? If you have to move, uh, in this case, MMMs from one ziplock to another you know, on the ground, you just flip one upside down and you're done, right? But in space, it doesn't work that way. And so one um, get around is to centrifuge. And it takes a little bit of scale. I mean, that was towards the end of the mission, but you can, you know, to spin around and you can make them go out one ziplock and into the next one. I prefer to move the M&Ms from the Ziploc to my mouth usually. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. After we eat all this food, we have to go weigh ourselves. And this is how you weigh yourself in space. It's basically a spring and it measures how long it takes you to go up and down on the spring. And based on your mass is how long that spring takes. And then when you realize you gain too much weight, you get on the treadmill and it's on the wall. And uh, here's the exercise machine I was talking about earlier. Um, exercise is a big part of it. And they schedule us usually for two and a half hours a day. Occasionally the station has to maneuver itself. If there's debris in space that we have to avoid, it will uh, climb or descend. And this is what it's like to be on board the space station when the rocket engines are firing. As you can see, it, do it doesn't move that fast. It's a million pound vehicle and it's a very slow um, climb. Another part of being a human is you have to get your hair cut. And I'll tell you, as a, I'm a combat pilot and I've done spacewalks and launched on the space shuttle, the most stressful thing by far that I've done in space is this right here. Um, giving Samantha a haircut in space was very was a uh, was a big deal. We we had to train for the it pressure. here on Earth. <laughs> the pressure was on. I would have had the wrath of every Italian woman on Earth had I messed that up. So that was a that was a very stressful moment. He did great. <laughs> the final product. We, got, we ended up getting extended by a month. Samantha mentioned one of the, well, several vehicles did not make it in the last year, but uh, when one of the Russian vehicles did not make it to the space station, they ended up extending us a month. And during that time, we got to move this module from the bottom of the station to the side, and this is a time lapse. Uh, it looks like it's moving very fast, but this actually takes about two orbits, so it's about a three hour long process to move this big, probably 10 or 15,000 pound module from uh, one part of the station to the other. And while we were in space, Mr. Leonard Nimoy uh, passed away and um, we uh, paid a tribute to him, Spock. Returning to Earth. Yeah, so after 200 days, uh, they said that we really had to come home. There's no way to stay longer. And so uh, this is us saying goodbye to our friends who are staying behind, Gennady, Scott and Misha. Two of them, by the way, are still up there on the space station. They're staying for a whole year. And this is our, uh, our Soyuz uh, departing. So that was it. Uh, it's time to go home. Uh, a few hours of uh, not much happening until we went around the, the world a couple of times, waiting for the right moment for the engines to burn so that we would actually get back to Kazakhstan and not to some unknown place on the planet. And in Kazakhstan, that's of course where they were waiting for us. And then a pretty wild ride towards the end. I mean, you can see this, this was the view out of our window. Uh, at some point, for a few minutes, we were going through plasma. So basically, we were in a ball of fire, slowing down, uh, before eventually the parachute opened, which is a pretty violent shock when the parachute opens. And then you're like, you know, shaken for, for, a, for a minute or so. Um, and then eventually you hit the ground like that. And that's a pretty cool shot. That's just a fraction of a second before you hit the ground. The retro rockets fire to dampen that impact. And then after about 10, 15 minutes, the, the, the guys and girls out there, they're ready to take you out. And they, they, um, they help you out of the capsules one by one. Um, you're a little bit dizzy at the beginning. You, you also feel like uh, you're 500 tons all, all of a sudden. Because of course, you know, we, we have been weightless for so long that our brain was just not used to handle weight at all. And so we, we took it easy in those chairs for, for a little while and then they put us on a helicopter first to the Karaganda airport and then on a plane back to Houston. And as soon as we landed in Houston, the scientists got hold of us and they started taking blood and taking urine and make us do tests and all kinds of stuff. And they haven't stopped. They haven't stopped quite yet. <laughs> One of the best things to do in space is to uh, look at, look back on Earth, and uh, there's just an endless 
stream of amazing views that we have. This is in the, the Middle East and the Persian Gulf, the Palm Islands. Um, these rivers in Indonesia and, and uh, are, are amazing to see. The Bahamas is definitely on my to-do list now. Um, a lot of shallow, beautiful green, blue waters around Earth, but the Bahamas, Caribbean, and Florida, that area really stands out. It's unique. We had a chance to see a lot of tropical storms and hurricanes and cyclones. This one here in particular, my sack, was, was unbelievable. The, the eye was so big. Um, I've certainly never seen anything like that before. Um, this is the cupola module where we do most of our looking out, and it's just incredible. It's a, a cool reflection there. Um, night times are amazing, especially over Africa and Indonesia and uh, South America, where the, the lightning storms are just spectacular. View of the Middle East going from the Mediterranean uh, over the Arabian Peninsula. A lot of beautiful places on Earth, and Samantha mentioned this earlier today that the um, you get used to seeing Earth by colors, and you, you kind of know countries by what they look like from space now. You know, countries that I really had no idea about before, now I know what they look like. This is an example of some African thunderstorms, and the southern lights, um, Aurora Australis, is. Uh, it's kind of unreal. I mean, it really, and you can see the aurora dancing around. This is moon glint on the Gulf of Mexico. Here's a fisheye view through the cupola. It's hard to say what my favorite picture is, but I, I think this was my favorite. <laughs> um, early in the mission, seeing the northern lights, that was the UK. This is Scandinavia, Norway and Sweden and Denmark and Finland. And then we move on um, past uh, St. Petersburg on to Moscow. You can see St. Petersburg there. Uh, Moscow really stands out at night. It's this bright star in the, in the middle right there. Um, and at nighttime, and during the day you see a very thin blue atmosphere. At nighttime you see this upper um, portion of our atmosphere that goes up maybe 100 kilometers or more and uh, that brown haze color is real at nighttime you see that with your eye and uh, it's amazing. Here's the Nile River into Cairo and Alexandria and you can see Israel's a really small couple bright lights there and uh, a lot of the Middle East. Baghdad's off to the right. Yeah, New Zealand on one of the very few Days. Here's Samantha's favorite. It's Italy. Yeah. Down the road, Rome, Naples, now towards the south, Calabria, Puglia, then to Sicily, and to the left. <clears throat> this is a neat starscape. Um, the time lapse makes it move really fast. Of course, when you're flying, it, it's not moving quite that fast. But uh, you can see the um, one of the Magellanic clouds. They're really small galaxies near our galaxy, and then the main Milky Way here. Um, but uh, if you turn all the lights off inside, you can actually see this with your eyes, and it's spectacular. So that's 200 days and 20 minutes. All right, we're going to take some more questions, but yes. first we've got an online question we're going to start with. Have you had the opportunity to follow up on science experiments conducted by you on the space station? Some of it, yeah. Uh, I, I've been in contact a lot with the uh, Italian principal investigators um, for, for my mission to space because it was a ticket, let's say, of the Italian Space Agency, then the Italian Space Agency also selected a number of um, experiments that were really tied to this mission. Um, a lot of other experiments, you know, they, they start earlier, they, you just, just keep on going, and so you may, maybe you don't have that strong relationship with scientists. Uh, plus, I was involved from the very beginning since the selection. In some cases, I helped out, um, figure out a few, a few details of the protocol we would do. And so I've definitely talked to them. Um, and of course, they, they caution and, uh, and, and tell you that, you know, you have to be patient with science. I mean, they, you know, some of them just got their samples back, uh, some of them got data. But to do a proper analysis of the data requires time. 
but um, what I can say, and I'm really happy about that, is that we were successful in the sense that they all got the data that they wanted, they all got the samples back that they wanted, so we were very successful operationally. And then I'm curious myself to see maybe in a year time or so when they're ready with their analysis and they maybe publish something, I, I'm very curious to see what will come out. <coughs> awesome. All right, we've got another audience question. Mm -hmm. That, right, that's a great question because we had lots and lots of emergency alarms go off. I started a scoreboard on the, on the space station. We would make a tick mark every day, a warning or caution would go off. Luckily and thankfully, um, most of them were false alarms and it just gave us some practice. But the big emergencies that we train for are fires and depressurizations and also we call it an ammonia leak or toxic atmosphere. Ammonia is a very dangerous chemical, and it's, it's the coolant that we use on the outside of the station. So if that leaked inside, um, that would be a bad day. So we spend a lot of time training before we launch for those emergencies. Good and question. Fire behaves a lot differently in space, right? It does. The good news is um, it burns itself out because there's no convection. So unless you have a fan to move the air around, if there's a fire, it should you know, burn and then be gone shortly. So we haven't really had any problems with fires, thankfully, so far on the space station. Um, and the first thing that the vehicle does is an automatic response. If there's a fire, it turns off all the fans. So in theory, all the airflow should be gone and whatever caught on fire should put itself out very quickly. Awesome. All right, we've got another audience question. Hi, my name is Day Juan. And my question is, what courses do you have to take in college to become an astronaut? Well, that is a really good question. I'll answer it real quickly. From th to be a NASA astronaut, there's not one set of things that you have to do. My path was to be a pilot, so I went to the Air Force Academy, and I was a math major. Um, uh, all astronauts have some type of technical math or science or engineering degree, but uh, other astronauts were engineers before they became astronauts. Some were medical doctors uh, or pilots, like I said. But um, in, in, as long as you have some type of technical degree, there's lots of different paths to be astronaut. Good luck. Awesome. All right, we've got an online question. Being an astronaut, is it important is it more challenging on the physiological side or the physical side, psychological side? <laughs> oh, interesting. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I think there's, uh, there's different aspects. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that there is a psychological challenge that stands out as opposed to a physical challenge that stands out. Uh, you know, the, the, the thing about being an astronaut I think that that's the biggest challenge and uh, that's how we kind of select people to, to make sure that they can face this challenge is that um, you have to learn a lot of different things and be able to switch gears from one thing to the next real quick. So we don't need to really look for people who are really super high achievers in one field. We're not really looking for like the, the Nobel laureate scientist or the uh, Olympic athlete or the... We, we really look for people who are not that bad in anything. Right. <laughs> So, uh, you know, you need to be able to learn languages, to fly a space vehicle, to um, practice underwater, and that's definitely physically challenging. Yeah, to, yeah, yeah to, to somehow perform little um, uh, medical procedures on your colleagues, to, to talk to people. I hope you, I hope you enjoy us talking, but uh, I mean, <laughs> you, you might think, oh my God, you guys are so bad at it. <laughs> Hopefully not. Um, but so, um, you know, I, I guess that that's really the, the challenge, to be able to learn many things quickly. <clears throat> All right, we've got an audience question. Uh, my question is, how long do it take for you to get outer space? How long does it take to get to outer space? Right. To get to outer space, uh, that launch that we did take, took eight and a half minutes, and then the engine shut down and we were floating in space for 200 days. Um, to get back from space, it takes closer to maybe 30 or 40 minutes. Um, your spaceship is undocked from the station, it turns around backwards and fires the engine, so instead of accelerating and climbing, it decelerates and slows down, uh, and then you start coming down, and that's a slower process. If you came back in eight minutes, you, the forces would be so strong, the, the capsule would melt, and we'd be squashed into little pancakes. So we, we come back a little bit slower, which I'm really happy about, because we don't end up as pancakes. And uh, so coming back takes about 30 or 40 minutes. We've got an online question next. Does the caffeine in coffee have a different effect on your body in space? 
maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that has been studied. So um, just from our perception, I guess probably not, but it, it's really hard to say. I mean, I don't know how much coffee was in the, in, in the coffee we drank, and I didn't really monitor it specifically. Um, so I guess the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> All right, we've got an audience question. Hi, my name is Courtney, and what was the hardest thing about being in outer space? The hardest thing about being in outer space. Hi, Courtney. <coughs> it may be when you're there for 200, when I was there on a space shuttle mission, it was such a quick mission, it was the work, and it really was tiring. Um, for 200 days, it's probably just missing home a little bit, missing your friends and family, and uh, things like that. Luckily, we, were, we had a contact with people on Earth, so we were able to stay in touch with them. And uh, when you're flying in space, you, you treat it as such a unique and great opportunity. And you know you have the rest of your life to be on Earth, so you try and enjoy it as much as you can. So it wasn't too bad, but uh, that, that, you, know, you miss home. We've got another audience question. I wonder, do, you, like, do your muscles ever get numb like when you're out of space? Muscles, muscles hurt and have yeah. problems, yeah. You want to talk about that? Um, you know, I, I, it kind of, it's very individual. Some people have a little bit of back pain at the beginning as their, you know, your spine kind of elongates, and so you might have a little bit of muscle pain in, in your back as your muscles kind of adapt and stretch. Um, I, I, I personally didn't have that. Um, you might just injure yourself while you work out, and that's kind of like the same as happens occasionally on Earth, and that actually happened to me. So for, for, for a few days, I couldn't work out because I had injured a muscle. Um, that, that's very similar to what happens on the ground. My muscles really hurt when I came back. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, my, my calves just from walking, because you haven't walked for 200 days, and all of a sudden, guess what, you have to walk. And, uh, and that was really hard. So I had a really, really sore muscles for, for several days after I came back, and that was just purely from walking. Did it take a long time to adjust to being back on Earth? Yeah, everybody's different. You know, there's some guys that t it's months later, they're still having adjustment issues. And I, I personally, I really lucked out. I, it took, I mean, the first day I was really dizzy, um, but very quickly, I was, the first day I was at the gym for an hour and a half. And, and for me personally, the adjustment happened a lot faster than I thought it would. I was kind of surprised. All right. Got another audience question? Excuse me, what college did you go to? All right. <laughs> That's, you got to say college is for in Samantha's case. I went to the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. Um, it's like the Naval Academy here in Annapolis. It's a little bit better, and, and, uh, but, it's like, and, uh, but Samantha went to a lot of colleges, so I'll let her talk about that. Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm European, of course, so I, I went to the University of Munich, um, and then as, as, as part of my studies there, I also studied a little bit in Toulouse, France, and a little bit in Moscow. And after that, I joined the Italian Air Force, and so I studied again in the uh, Italian Air Force Academy. Another audience question? Oh, excuse me. What was your favorite activity to do in space? Favorite activity in space? Well, for me, I'll say uh, taking pictures. I love taking pictures of inside, of outside, of the Earth, of stars. I just like taking pictures and video of anything. Yeah, I, I, I enjoy taking pictures too, but, but really, I liked the variety of the work you do up there. I mean, I, I'm somebody who, uh, and, and that's not a good thing, but uh, you know, I, I can get bored pretty easily. And so the fact that um, up there we could do such a big variety of things, you know, one moment you're doing a science experiment and then a different one, and then you're doing maintenance and you're really doing something hands-on, and then you're, uh, you know, maybe talking to students on the ground. And, uh, um, you know, it, it's a big variety of things. And so it just kept me um, interested and, and uh, in a way entertained, although it was a lot of work, really, that we were doing. <clears throat> We've got an online question next. For Terry, how is a space shuttle mission different from a Soyuz mission? So the space shuttle uh, mission lasted about two weeks, and it was very scripted. We, I knew every day what I was doing uh, well in advance. I knew they had in five-minute blocks every minute of your, of your time was, was scripted. And uh, it was frankly exhausting. When I got back, I slept for 13 and a half hours uninterrupted, which was uh, I hadn't done since I was probably one year one years old. Um, the the Soyuz mission, if you talk about just getting there and back, is very different because it's really cramped and small. And uh, we got to the station very quickly in only six hours. The shuttle took two days to get there, and uh, coming back was landing in a capsule was like kind of like driving your car through your neighborhood and running into a telephone pole. Was the Soyuz landing? 
whereas a shuttle landed like an airplane. So the Soyuz and shuttle were different in that way. But the bigger difference was the Soyuz mission was in conjunction with a station mission, so it was 200 days. And so it was really moving to space rather than just going on vacation to space. Awesome. All right, we've got an audience question. I don't really have a question, but I just want to say thank you so much for all the work that you've done and all the social media engagement that you guys both do. Um, I follow you both on Twitter, and I think it's just a really great thing that you come out to things like this, and it's, it's inspiring. So thank you very much. Thank you. Go ahead. When you came back from space, like, could you walk? Could you walk? Yeah. Well, um, I took, I think we, we took our first steps. So what happened is like, you know, you saw in the movie, they, they kind of take you in these chairs, and then we probably spent about what, half an hour in the chair, and then about probably a half an hour more in like a, a field tent that they built, it's like a little medical tent, probably half an hour more. So I yeah. guess between an hour and an hour and a half after landing, we, we took our first steps. And uh, I guess I could walk, but I, I had people on both sides of me, like making sure that I wouldn't fall over. And it really felt weird. It felt like my body was like this giant rock weighing 100 tons, and I was trying to balance this rock on tiny little toothpicks that felt like my <laughs> legs. <laughs> All right, have audience questions? Um, hi, I have two questions. Um, first of all, was it disappointing when you, you um, are expecting the, the uh, resupply ship to come and it, and it doesn't come? Like, are, are you very disappointed by that or you just say, oh, well, no big deal? Well, I, of course it was disappointing. Um, there's equipment and science experiments, but Samantha and I lucked out because our personal items, we don't take much personal items, there's a small thing. But our personal items were not on there. That would have really been disappointing had we, you know, little jewelry and things we'd had for our families. So we lucked out in that everything that was on there was replaceable from our personal point of view. Um, the bigger issue when the Russian vehicle didn't make it, it was a similar rocket to what we launched, the Soyuz humans launch on. And so they had to take some time to make sure they were ready for the next human launch. And therefore, there was some uncertainty if we were going to stay in space for longer or not. So we had a a period of uncertainty, are we staying in space or are we going back to Earth? And um, it wasn't so much disappointing as it was unknown and we didn't know what, what the schedule was going to be. You know, we, didn't, we couldn't make summer plans yet because we didn't know if we were going to be in space or not. My last question, I, I was just wondering, how hard is it to get used to sleeping in a bag on a wall? Like <laughs> <laughs> There's not really on the wall. It's, once you close your eyes, you're floating. You have no idea where you're at. And I didn't sleep on, I didn't Velcro or bungee myself to the wall. I just floated in my cabin, which was wonderful. It, I mean, I think Samantha too talks about how she just fell asleep instantly and, yeah. yeah. All right, we've got an online question next. Has there been any confirmation as to the length of the ISS mission? Will it continue beyond 2020? Um, that's a great question, and we're really planning on and looking forward to extending it uh, through at least 2024, hopefully longer. Um, it's an international effort, and a lot of the uh, international governments still have to decide that for sure, but it, it looks very positive that it'll go through at least 2024. Okay. Got an audience question? Uh, yeah, so were you guys able to see solar and lunar eclipses from space, and what were, they, what were they like seeing them from the ISS? What were the eclipses like? Were you able to see them? Solar there was solar one, case. yeah. In the, yeah, we yeah. Um, we were up there for one, and uh, unfortunately, we don't really have any equipment on the space station to observe safely a, a solar eclipse. So what we did see was the shadow. That was kind of cool, actually. <laughs> we, we we actually could see the shadow that the moon was was casting on on the Earth's surface. I, I think I took a picture. It's it's online somewhere, and it's uh, in the Atlantic. and then when he yeah it was over yeah. the northern planning and. Uh, and then when it kind of, the sun set, you know, we, we actually saw a sunset mm -hmm. when the sun was partially covered. And that's where the point where you can actually safely watch. And, uh, and, and that was kind of cool to, to see, you know, you could see a little bit of it missing. <laughs> but uh, I, I took pictures, but I took pictures like blind because I, I couldn't really yeah. watch. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you guys so much for talking with us today. We'd like to thank Boeing for sponsoring the What's New in Aerospace. We're getting ready to wrap this up. If you're on uh, Twitter, you can go to the Air and Space Twitter feed. We're getting ready to do a Periscope interview with Terry here in just a few minutes afterwards. So be sure to tune into that with the link that we're going to send out on Twitter. Thank you for watching.